I see we're getting some participants adding in here, but we'll start pretty promptly here. We'll go exactly 60 minutes, and I know we have a lot to cover, and hopefully you'll have questions. Um, we'll have some question and answer time at the end. Um, welcome to the training session brought to you by the Society of American Archivists, Archivists of Religious Collections section. My name is Joel Thorson from the Evangelical Lutheran Church in America. And I want to read the land acknowledgement here. Uh, we acknowledge that we live and work on the traditional lands of many indigenous nations. We know that indigenous people have suffered from historical and ongoing injustices and understand as an archival organization that we must work towards sharing historical truths and renew respectful relationships with indigenous communities. We respect the longstanding relationships that indigenous nations have to this land as the original caretakers. We are grateful for their stewardship and protection of the water and earth. We pay our respects to elders past and present. Uh, today's topic is how to start an archives. Before I introduce our presenter, let's review this, this uh, the disclaimer on this first slide. The content in these presentations is for information only and is not legal advice. Our views do not represent the organizations where we work. We do not make any endorsements or guarantees. We are not liable for any loss or damage caused by your use of the content we provide. It is your responsibility to critically evaluate the content provided in the presentation or any accompanying materials. Now, remember, you will not be able to use your microphone or video during this session. You can click on the closed captioning button at the bottom of your screen and under live transcript, click enable auto transcription to get closed captioning. There will be a question period after the presentation concludes. You should use the Q&A feature to ask your questions. We will not answer questions in the chat or unmute attendees due to time constraints. Please be respectful in your interactions. We expect you to follow the SAA code of concept, conduct, which is on the website there. This session will be recorded and please fill out the short survey after the session ends. We encourage you to join the Society of American Archivists if you are not a member. We thank the Congregation of the Sisters of St. Joseph in Canada for hosting this webinar. And now I'd like to introduce our presenter, Dr. Ellen Scheinberg, President of Heritage Professionals in Toronto, a consulting firm specializing in archival, museum, and information management services. Her clients have included government entities, education and health institutions, corporations, nonprofits, clubs, private donors, along with archives and libraries. The projects the firm is currently engaged in are fairly eclectic, ranging from setting up new archives to creating exhibitions, digitization strategies, and space assessment for clients. Ellen started her career as an archivist at the National Archives of Canada, working there from 1990 to 2000. She went on to serve as director of the Ontario Jewish Archives for nine years, later taking on the role of senior manager in charge of outreach, digitization, and exhibitions at the Archives of Ontario, before launching her consulting firm in 2012. She has published widely in a number of areas, archival studies, women's history, labor history, Jewish studies, and immigration history. She recently co-edited the book, The Ward, The Life and Loss of Toronto's First Immigrant Neighborhood in 2015, and contributed several articles to The Ward Uncovered, The Archaeology of Everyday Life in 2018. The former was the winner of the Heritage Toronto Book Award and both works we're finalists for the Toronto Book Award and the Ontario Speakers Award. Ellen, welcome. Thank you very much. Um, so I will share the screen and uh, get started. Oh, sorry, I will start from the beginning. That's better. Okay. Well, welcome everybody. Um, so the uh, presentation today is how to start an archives. And uh, this is one of the archives that I, my team has set up uh, a number of years ago. Um, and uh, we have uh, clients across the uh, uh, greater Toronto area, along with some in other parts of Ontario. Uh, but uh, yeah, this is kind of a, what a medium sized archive would look like that we've set up. So some background information, Joel filled you in on uh, a good part of uh, my background and uh, professional life. Uh, so Heritage Professionals was set up uh, just over 10 years ago and he gave our main services, so I won't repeat them. 
Uh, I work with a team of uh, archival staff, uh, usually anywhere from you know, two to four people, depending on the size of the project. Um, and uh, uh, Joel included the kind of uh, entities uh, that we help out. Um, so because a good part of my work involves uh, creating new archives, we do about anywhere from three to five new archives a year. Um, I'll talk about sort of the integral aspects involved and some of the things that you would need to know and the sequence in which to proceed. And um, I'll also try to inject, you know, some anecdotes and uh, best practices um, and try to uh, include elements that uh, might be helpful to you um, and uh, help you deal with uh, some of the daunting elements involved in uh, creating an archives. So I also have a disclaimer. <laughs> so uh, I am not a lecturer, I'm a consultant. So this is a very informal presentation. And uh, so uh, I'm just trying to give you uh, basic tips, but uh, you're also, I would advise you to get some of the key readings uh, involved in setting up an archives uh, if you want more detailed information about any of the specific tasks. Um, so we'll keep it informal. And if you have any questions, you can ask at the end, uh, especially if it relates to your own archive and specific issues you're grappling with at work. So where to start? Um, that's often an interesting question. Uh, most of the time when you start a new archives, you're not starting from scratch. A lot of the time they'll show you a room with 20 boxes, 100 boxes, and for some, it may include several storage rooms or facilities. I have a number, a number of clients who had a room full of records and then they had offsite storage materials. And so you never know. Sometimes you're looking at, you know, a handful of boxes, but, you know, it's not unusual to have anywhere from 100 to thousands. Uh, when I started my work as director of the Ontario Jewish Archives, they had about 5,000 boxes with no physical or intellectual control over it. So that was definitely daunting. And uh, hopefully uh, most of your projects will be uh, less uh, uh, you know, intense and uh, challenging, but uh, you know, here are some useful tips. Uh, the photo to the right is uh, an archives that we started for a client. Um, it was a big uh, shopping mall, a uh, very elegant mall in Toronto. And I was expecting that the records would be in good shape and stored above ground, but no, uh, there were about 50 to 80 boxes in the basement and uh, they were in disarray and uh, there were presence of ants or insects and other things. So uh, even if it looks like it should be a very glamorous assignment, you never know what you're gonna find in those uh, boxes. Um, so the first challenge is really trying to look at this group of eclectic materials and try to envision uh, what the archives will look like when it's done and sort of dealing with everything step by step and not getting too intimidated. So here are some of the basic tips. Usually it's good to start with a list or an inventory of the records just to have an idea of what's there. And, you can uh, use Word or you can use an Excel spreadsheet to do that. And uh, make sure you identify the location. If you have a large number of shelves or different rooms or, or uh, storage facilities, um, the nature of the materials, the media, uh, the extent and uh, the condition of the records, if there's any issues there. And this will help you plot out your strategy uh, establish what kind of work will be involved, the funds you need, equipment, supplies, and resources moving forward. So you'll also want to get into creating a budget for this preliminary work. And you'll have to include elements like what will you need for office and archival supplies. Um, generally, we use uh, supplies from uh, uh, staples and uh, office stores like the vinyl coated paper clips um, and other uh, materials, but uh, archival supplies are essential, of course, uh, file folders, boxes, uh, envelopes. Uh, you may need furniture to do the work, uh, equipment, computers, scanners. 
uh, labor? Will you need assistance uh, from volunteers or other staff, depending on the size of the collection? Uh, will you need conservation support if there's any major issues that you flagged? Uh, shelving is always very helpful, even from the start, so that you don't have all your records on the floor and, you know, if you don't have space to really accommodate them. So in terms of a starting point, once you get past the inventory and the budget, it's very good to start with the collection mandate and acquisition strategy. Um, I often work with uh, my clients um, and would advise you to work with your patron or a board or committee that's involved to sketch out what your uh, collection mandate will be. Um, a lot of archives don't have that. And so there's not a clear sense as to what your role is within the archival community, uh, what you collect, what you don't collect, uh, just what the parameters are around what you acquire. Um, so when you do this, you'll have some type of criteria and the cri each criterion could relate to geographic. Perhaps you just collect materials from a specific town or city or state. Uh, what kind of media do you collect? Everything archival? Um, what about artifacts, books, artwork? Um, and, uh, you know, do you collect ephemera? And, um, you know, so it's, it's good to consider all those things and uh, also establish what others around you are collecting so that there's not a lot of redundancy um, and, and make sure that you have a really tight uh, mandate. And uh, then you can get into an acquisition strategy that will help you uh, sort of navigate how you want to acquire materials in the future, what your goals are for the repository, and uh, how you should be proceeding uh, when you're engaged in that activity. So other policies, procedures, and forms that you should think about that would be a higher priority would include a deed of gift form, a donation policy and procedures, accessioning and deaccessioning policy, procedures and forms, researcher policy forms and database, care and handling procedures for researchers, reprography and digitization procedures forms, and a fee list to go with that, a preservation policy, and emergency preparedness plan. And I'll get into more details about some of these uh, individual uh, items. So the deed of gift form, I have a nice uh, image of uh, a door with a Christmas gift. And so it sort of tells you, you know, a, a donation can be a wonderful gift to the archives, but you never know what's in that box. It could be a horror as well. So uh, you really want that deed of gift form to control acquisitions and know what you're getting. And also to make sure that people don't leave anything unexpected and without proper detail and context. Um, so it's a very essential um, item to uh, produce. So the purpose of the deed of gift form is to make sure that the transfers or donations are legal in terms of transferring ownership or title from the donor to the archives. Without that, you don't own the records and family members who want them back, whether it's two years, five years, 20 years later, can just arrive and ask for it. And it would be very hard to de deny them that. It also makes sure that uh, copyright, privacy, access, monetary appraisals, tax receipts, and other issues are covered off. If you're not issuing tax receipts or you're not worried about some of these elements, that's fine. But it's definitely important to consider all these things um, and discuss it with your board or patron and, and make sure that the deed of gift form is comprehensive. Uh, it would also be a good idea to look at what other institutions have done and, and draw models from the community and find one that's suitable for your institution and uh, perhaps have your corporate lawyer take a look at it before you start using it to make sure that you've covered all the bases and that it'll hold up if, if need be. And uh, yeah, then you'll look at your holdings and see if they're covered by a deed of gift form. If not, you may want to approach the families or the departments or whoever donated them to you and perhaps have them sign the deed of gift form after the fact to make sure that 
you're protected. If if you can't find people, so be it. But you know, try to put an effort in to uh, make sure that's covered. Okay, so tackling the records in your custody. Uh, typically, it's best to start with analog records that are in your archives. Um, so I mentioned that you might be dealing with a few boxes of records, or it could be hundreds or thousands. Um, if there are digital records in the boxes, like floppy disks, DVDs, or external drives, it's best to just leave them till the end until you finish the textual records and analog materials. So the starting point is to have a proper workspace. A lot of the times when you set up an archives, the people you're working with, if they're non-archivists, have no idea what your needs are. And sometimes they'll try to stick you in a little cubby hole or they won't even give you a space to process the material. So make sure that you're clear about what you need. And generally what that includes is a very long table for processing, usually at least five to eight feet in length or two tables. Um, you'll need some shelving around the perimeter if possible to accommodate the records, especially if there's more than like 40, 50 boxes. Uh, a desk for uh, organizing and doing your cataloging work. A huge waste bin if you're disposing of metal clips and uh, old binders and other things. And make sure that you have a door that locks so that the records that you're working on are going to be safe along with your supplies and equipment. So how to proceed when you're archiv ar archiving your heritage assets. Uh, so as I mentioned, I usually start with the analog records and I go in this order, textual, ephemera, architectural, graphic, and AV. Um, I like starting with the textual because uh, usually it's the most voluminous uh, and it also gives you insight into the other media and uh, some context. Um, once you finish that, you can uh, move into the digital records. Uh, that would include all the uh, external drives that you found, but maybe materials on uh, the server as well or cloud. Uh, the digital arrangement should be similar to the analog, and it should be clear whether they're born digital or scans. And if they're if they're scanned images or duplicate the analog, just make sure that you cross-reference everything. And when you're going through the records on the server that belong to the clients or, or your uh, parent institution, make sure you include IT and all of that. Okay. Okay, so this is the, um, I'm just going to try this. Okay, this is sort of the chart of how uh, I usually proceed and the sequence uh, that I would recommend following when you're archiving the records. Usually start with appraisal and selection and then intellectual arrangements and the production, production of an arrangement scheme followed by the physical arrangement, uh, then the preservation and processing work uh, description follows that at the and then physical control. And once that's done, you can engage in uh, digitization initiatives. And finally, the outreach uh, and exhibitions that are always fun. So appraisal and selection. Um, I can't really uh, provide insight into how to do that properly in one slide, but uh, there's a lot of great literature out there. And uh, essentially it's really an important step before you get into uh, uh, processing preservation and uh, description and arrangement. But um, the main thing is, you know, uh, I think a lot of archivists don't have a great deal of comfort when it comes to appraisal and they're usually fine eliminating uh, duplicates and maybe materials that were created by an external body, but um, it's it's definitely worth taking some courses and, and doing some extra reading to just make sure that you have that comfort level, because uh, it does make a big difference in terms of being able to tackle large projects and feel confident about your decisions. So when calling materials that are non-archival, um, and don't have archival value, uh, make sure that you document that whole process. Uh, create a memo and a summary of those materials 
um, so that you'll be able to keep it on file and uh, justify the decision making. You may also have to approach the donor if you've agreed to return materials to them, or you may need to um, share this with your parent institution um, and, and get some level of approval before you destroy anything. Um, it's always good to arrange the calls into categories so they're more accessible and easier to go through if someone needs to review, review them. And make uh, sure that you take precautions before you dispose of the files, especially if there's personal or sensitive information. Um, make sure that uh, it's shredded on site or by a company that can uh, protect uh, the, uh, the, the security of the records involved. Uh, intellectual arrangement. Uh, this step usually involves re reviewing the records uh, before they're physically arranged, uh, identifying the series that are within the phone and in terms of the main functions, events, initiatives associated with it or the individuals involved. And then determine below that level if there's any sub-series that you want to include or sub-functions. Uh, for instance, if you have a board of directors series you may want to create sub-series for meetings and another one for reports and a third for correspondence or something else. Um, and once you have that, you can create your arrangement scheme and decide, you know, uh, what, what it'll look like under that, whether there's file levels, likely, or even item levels. I tend not to use item levels very much. Uh, it's very popular in the museum and library world, but in archives, you know, the records are so voluminous and especially with textual records, uh, it really doesn't make sense to use item levels, but with photos um, and ephemera, uh, sometimes it's it's worth the time if you, if you finish everything else to uh, do some item levels for really uh, pivotal items that you feel like the public will be interested in. Um, so produce your arrangement scheme and if you need approval for it, um, you know, that's a great way to go through it with uh, your your boss or your parent institution and make sure they're comfortable with it. Um, and then make sure you assign numbers for each level, which will become your final reference numbers. Physical arrangement. So that's when you go through the records and tackle them um, uh, one media at a time and sort them into the series, sub-series and files that reflect your arrangement scheme. Uh, I often rely on the original folders they're in and uh, bankers boxes and then use post-it notes to sort of identify what the series is and the sub-series and files. And that way you can sort of pull them and move them around and you're not wed to it and you don't have a lot of pencil marks on the file folder since the acid-free folders are quite pricey. And uh, once arranged, go, go through everything once or twice more to refine your arrangement and make sure that you're comfortable with uh, everything and it falls into place nicely. Processing and preservation. Uh, it's good to begin by uh, ordering your archival supplies early on. Sometimes it can take a while for them to arrive, especially uh, if they're items that are not often in stock. Um, it's always good to have things like acid-free file folders and boxes on site. Um, you may also need envelopes for photos or clear enclosures um, or oversized boxes and folders for uh, other types of materials. Um, the companies, uh, I in Canada, I use Car McLean, but in the US, uh, Gaylord and University Products are quite good, but uh, everyone has their favorites. Um, and uh, once your supplies arrive, you can start rehousing everything, uh, which the, the processing process usually involves removing paper clips, rusty staples, the binders, rubber bands, anything that's dangerous for the records. Um, and um, yeah, it's always good to separate the news clippings. There's a lot of acid in newspapers and uh, generally, uh, they're non-archival, but if you feel like they're beneficial and no one else is collecting them, then uh, store them separately and perhaps create a, a reference series uh, unless it's part of your phone. Um, and then in terms of albums and scrapbooks, they're often really 
uh, unique and, and fun um, and colorful, but they can be a challenge, especially I included a photo of a scrapbook on the right that's sort of my nemesis, the ones with adhesive that were popular in the 80s. Uh, those are really hard to remove photos from. And generally, I would say, you know, proceed with caution. Uh, you know, you could do a little test corner, but don't don't force anything and you may want to consult with an expert. Um, and also you might have some contextual information within the album. So uh, when you remove the photos, you might lose that. So I would say, you know, try to keep it in intact, but uh, some people uh, scan or photograph the whole album and then they remove it. But yeah, make sure that you do your due diligence before um, taking anything apart. And for artifacts, this photo in the middle is uh, the type of tray I use for artifacts. We just nestle the small one items um, in acid-free tissue paper and there's special trays you can buy. So, uh, you know, these uh, archival uh, supply companies always have uh, amazing um, items for different types of uh, media. So uh, you'll see uh, what you need and uh, yeah, there's lots of options. For conservation work, um, if any of the records that you reviewed are damaged or require treatment, put them aside, put a note in your spreadsheet and uh, uh, perhaps have a conservator come by and view them. Uh, this could include documents or materials that are ripped, have damage from insects, fire, water damage or mold. Uh, it could also include photos that are tightly rolled due to dryness or negatives with vinegar syndrome. Uh, if you spot records with mold or vinegar syndrome, you definitely want to separate them. You want to handle them with caution using uh, proper mask and latex gloves and uh, consult the conservator uh, as to how to uh, proceed because uh, you don't want these items to endanger the rest of the collection. And if your institution doesn't have the funds to hire someone to do the conservation work, uh, you might be able to proceed in stages and, and maybe engage in some kind of fundraising or find a grant uh, that will help you uh, bring in someone who can help you do the work that's necessary. So description is next. I included a definition for description, uh, the creation of an accurate representation of each font and its component parts by the process of capturing, collating, analyzing, and organizing any information that serves to identify archival material and explain the context and record systems which produced it. So this could include, uh, involve describing records by using an Excel inventory, which isn't unusual for small archives. Um, a lot of small archives use Excel or Access. Um, uh, you could use a finding aid in Word, or uh, you could rely on an archival database uh, with InMagic, Maniasis, or another uh, software product. And uh, when you're doing your descriptions, uh, you can adhere to archival standards using the rules for archival description, mark, eat, or another format. Um, but you know, if it's a small institution and there's less pressure to adhere to these uh, professional standards, you could either adopt a hybrid approach or something less formal. It's, it's really up to you in, in terms of your mandate and your clientele and, and your uh, parent institution. The main thing in terms of description is to make sure that it's accessible um, to staff within your organization and researchers and the general public if you open up your records uh, to external uh, uh, visitors. So archival space and equipment, uh, make sure to locate a space for the records that's large enough to house your holdings uh, once the archival work is done, but also to accommodate 15 to 20 years of accruals. Uh, this is uh, the vault for one of my clients, and it's got mobile, mobile shelving and room to grow for many, many years. But that's a luxury, and most small archives can't afford that. So you may start off with you know, a small number of uh, metal shelving units and you can always grow if you have the space to expand. Uh, so I mentioned always use metal shelving. Um, 
and you can buy them from a variety of places. Just make sure that they're stable and, uh, you know, that you, some come with wheels if, if you need that and, and they lock or, you know, you just decide what fits your space and your needs. Um, okay, you could, I was saying you could also buy special units for map cabinet or art storage, depending on if you have uh, many framed pieces to store. Um, Ideally, it would be nice to have a dedicated HVAC unit in your vault or storage area, but that's not always feasible for small institutions on a tight budget. So small archives often have to rely on uh, humidifiers and dehumidifiers to keep a stable environment. Uh, also watch out for light levels. Uh, you might want to cover windows and uh, you could, uh, I would I would recommend turning off the lights when you're not in in the vault or the storage area, just to be certain, just to be careful. Um, and you you probably would need a table in the storage area when you pull records when you're consulting them. So security and risk factors in terms of the storage. Um, make sure that uh, the storage space or vault has a security pad or uh, a lock to safeguard your records and make sure that only the archivists are allowed to enter that space uh, or people who you feel comfortable with. Ensure there's a fire suppression system. Uh, that could be a sprinkler system or an oxygen-based system. Uh, this uh, to the right is uh, the oxy oxygen-based system a client uses, but that's very high end. So uh, many institutions uh, rely on uh, sprinklers. Uh, if you don't have any of that, uh, that would be a concern and you should do a risk analysis to see how best to proceed uh, if there's no uh, type of fire suppression system in place. Uh, also have the facility manager assess to see if there's any potential for leaks. Uh, you could also buy a water detector to put on the floor in case you have any concerns about flooding or leaks. Uh, keep food and drink out of that space and remain vigilant when it comes to insects and vermin. It, food and drink is troublesome because I find, you know, you can have signage saying that you shouldn't have uh, beverages and, and uh, refreshments in your space. But sometimes people come in and they just bring their coffee into the vault or whatever. So I, I think sometimes you just have to be very upfront with them and sometimes brusque and just say, you know, it, it, it's not entering this uh, area. And yeah, that's something we all have to do. And I recommend getting a data logger to put on the wall in your vault or in the archives to make sure that you can keep track of the temperature and humidity levels and verify if there's any uh, drastic uh, changes or spikes. And uh, you can review the data on your computer and uh, decide how you want to proceed based on uh, what's transpired, you know, over the course of a week, two weeks or, or longer. Physical control. Uh, this involves establishing control over the location of the records and the containers that house them. Make sure that all the containers are numbered and that the box numbers are included in your finding aids or database for each series, subseries, and file. Uh, many institutions barcode boxes, but that's generally just used for larger repositories like NARA or uh, state archives. Uh, usually medium to small archives uh, don't need that. Uh, provide room locations uh, if you have your records in more than one space. Uh, and identify in a spreadsheet or database if any of your records are out on loan, uh, were sent to the conservator, or are not accessible to the public for preservation reasons. And if you have a lot of shelving, it might be a good idea to label uh, each uh, range, bay, and shelf to make retrievals easier. Digitization. This is an area that, uh, you know, is a very popular and Generally, every time a client or a prospective client approaches me, it's, I want to digitize all of our records. Would you be willing to do that? And the response by, you know, archivists is, I'm sorry, you know, that's not, you know, in line with professional protocols. So uh, generally, you have to sort of reassure people or, or mention to them that, you know, we don't digitize everything. And, uh, 
there's different steps to be taken when you look into what you want to digitize, how you want to do it, and uh, you know what what measures you should take. So I always start by creating a digitization strategy, um, and that involves looking at all the records once you've finished archiving them. And once you finish the digital archives, because you need to know if they're in digital format already or not, uh, establish what are your priority areas based on operational purposes, research demand, preservation needs, or special outreach projects that you're working on, um, and maybe any gaps that exist that you'd like to uh, fill. Um, you should also include issues like what resolution you should scan in, what format and approach, how they should be stored, uh, along with all sorts of other issues. So it's really something that requires a lot of deliberation and planning and documentation before launching into. And finally, establish uh, uh, which records should be uh, digitized in-house and which ones should be tackled by an external firm. Uh, most archives uh, will digitize uh, regular paper materials, uh, anything up to legal, uh, eight by 10 photos are smaller, but are not really equipped to deal with oversized photos, architectural drawings, artwork, so an AV. So uh, it's good to sort of identify what your needs are and who would be best suited to do this work and the costs involved. If you outsource, make sure that you get um, recommendations from colleagues. There's a lot of firms out there, uh, startups that uh, really may not have a lot of experience with archival records. Uh, you, you don't want your um, early documents being put through a feeder. You don't want them being handled by someone who has no idea how to deal with archival records. So it's really important to make sure that you're dealing with reputable firms that have that level of expertise. Outreach initiatives and exhibitions. Um, this is a very uh, kind of sexy area of archives and it's a great way to uh, promote your institution and showcase uh, your heritage treasures. Um, some of the outreach uh, pro products that, or projects you can uh, pursue would be speaker events, tours, physical or virtual exhibitions, newsletters or booklets, photo galleries, social media, the sky's the limit. Uh, and when producing these products and content, make sure to keep your audience in mind, keep the text brief. Uh, we tend to be pretty uh, verbose. Uh, a lot of archivists uh, have an academic background or are used to creating longer memos and materials. So it's always good to keep it very concise and, and short. Um, and make sure that everything you're writing is engaging and as interactive as possible. Uh, the photo to the left is uh, an image of an exhibition I worked on with a client to commemorate the 100th anniversary of the Spanish flu pandemic. Uh, it was displayed in the War Memorial and uh, all sorts of museums and archives across the country. And it at the time, we didn't think that People weren't aware or familiar with this pandemic, and most of us thought we'd never confront a pandemic again. But in retrospect, you know, I think this probably will travel a while longer and uh, may have larger appeal than we original originally thought. So, uh, although outreach initiatives might be out of your core services and may not be uh, easy to fund, you should look into grants, partnerships, or maybe bring in volunteers to help tackle these kind of initiatives and, and uh, to sort of supplement your budget. Reference services. Um, most archives have a mandate that includes making their records available to the public. Um, you'll need to decide who you serve. Um, will you only provide service to um, internal staff or will you open it up to external researchers? Uh, will you be open every day from nine to five for limited hours or by appointment only? All of those things are perfectly legitimate. It's really up to you to decide uh, how you want to proceed. And when creating a reference program, make sure to have information about your location hours, as well as reference protocols and services on your website so people are well aware of 
who you are, where you're located and, and, and how to proceed if they want to approach you. In addition, uh, make sure you have instructions on how to submit inquiries, what the turnaround time might be, and how to schedule a visit to the archives if they wanna come in and do research. Uh, there'll also be uh, decisions to be made about whether to put your finding aids or database online. Finally, uh, you should also give the public, uh, provide the public care and handling instructions uh, when before they see the records so they know uh, best practices and uh, uh, that, uh, you know, they shouldn't have food and drink in there and uh, whether they should wear white gloves or not when handling photos, uh, all those things are really important for them to know. Uh, information management, uh, a lot of archives don't have information management, but I really do see it as uh, an integral part of uh, running an archives. So once your archives is up and running, uh, it's something to look into. Um, Generally, uh, it's uh, the role is to manage active and semi-active records that your parents' institution produces and do so by creating different products like file plans and records retention schedules. If you don't feel comfortable, you don't have the training to carry out this yourself, consider hiring a contract professional who does or a consultant who can create those products for you along with policies and procedures. There's also training about available that you can get to learn those skills. I, I've taken uh, courses from ARMA uh, to sort of refresh my skills. There's always new technology coming out. And if you want to learn this yourself, it's a, a great way to do so. Um, I am is a great investment. It helps dramatically reduce uh, the numbers, the number of records that are heading to the archives. It creates a planned approach uh, lower storage costs, um, and uh, essentially it gives you peace of mind knowing that everything that's created by other departments is, you know, under control and they know how long to hold on to it and they won't be throwing out archival materials because it's identified which records to keep, which to destroy and when. So, you know, it, it's really a, a tremendous uh program to have. Uh, sustaining and growing your archives, this is sort of the last step. Uh, once you're set up, here are some of the things you might want to do at the end to make sure that uh, your institution grows and thrives. Create a strategic plan for at least a five-year period. It should cover staffing, salaries, budgeting for future needs, special in initiatives you'd like to include, uh, conservation needs, monetary appraisals you'd like to get done, digitization, et cetera. Also pull together a funding strategy to bring in uh, funds that you'll need to support these objectives. Uh, this could include raising money through events, reaching out to potential donors, applying for grants, or all of the above. Of the above. Um, consider bringing in volunteers and students to provide support. Uh, they can really help supplement your uh, workforce or just you if you're on your own. Um, if you pursue that option, make sure that you have special training and policies and procedures so they know what they're doing and they know what your expectations are. Uh, make sure to budget for training and development for yourself and your archival staff. Uh, this could include courses that are offered by local universities, by the SAA or other associations. Uh, to make sure that you're enhancing your skills and you're remaining current when it comes to new technologies and development in the field. Also, attending conferences is really beneficial, as well as workshops. Um, really networking with your uh, peers, fellow colleagues is a great way to learn how others are doing things um, and to develop sort of support groups, which is really important when you're working on your own. You can feel very isolated and you don't, no one has all the skills they need to do everything. So it's a great thing to reach out to others who have expertise in areas you feel you're lacking and really to uh, work together to support each other. And uh, make sure that you communicate with your manager and senior managers within your company or organization. This will help educate them about what you're doing since 
most non-archivists don't have a clue what's happening in the archives. It'll bolster your profile internally, and hopefully it will help secure greater support for the archives when you need it. When there's, when there's budget cuts that come down, it's really indispensable for those above to understand how critical the archives is, not only to uh, maintaining the legacy of the organization, but to helping in terms of good governance. So uh, definitely the profession can help you put a, a case together for that. And you know all of these things will really serve you well. Finally, um, as I mentioned, it's good to establish close uh, connections with your archival uh, colleagues um, and have that support group. Um, and here's some useful contacts I put together for uh, archival supply companies like Gaylord and University Products, uh, American Institute for Conservation, if you need a conservator, Appraisers Association of America for uh, monetary appraisals, uh, I use Hobo data loggers, but there's others on the market, but uh, the data loggers are very inexpensive compared to other <laughs> equipment. And it's a great investment. Uh, Society of American Archivists, I'm sure you have that uh, information in your members, but they would have tremendous tools on their site. And uh, it's a great resource. Irma, I would look into that and uh, you know check out their courses, especially with information management and um, new uh, uh, electronic record document management systems. And I've also used lynda.com for courses as well. They have some great uh, online courses for Excel if you want to expand your skills in that area, Photoshop, and a variety of other software that uh, you may not be familiar with or you may have not you know, uh, used for a while. So that's uh, the presentation. If you have any questions, uh, I'm happy to answer. We do have a couple of questions. Um, okay. The first one asks if you could go back to the slide on other policies. It was pretty early in the presentation. Okay, let's see. Um, so I will end the show. Okay. Other policies. Let's see, where did I put that? Um, was that at the front end? I think so. Uh, let's see. Someone says, let's see, lynda.com is now LinkedIn Learning. Oh, so was this the slide? Let's see. I think so. Uh, people are asking if you'd be willing to share your slides or if they'd be available. I know that the YouTube recording will be available, so that will be on our YouTube channel, so you can always look through it there. Uh, Alexis says, yes, that was the slide that they were looking for. Okay, great. Yeah, so they can definitely um, access it through the YouTube channel. Let's see, Margaret says, a brief clarification, reprotective gloves. Usually should wear nitrile, nitrile gloves as folks can develop an allergy to latex. That's very true. And now actually in the last few years, conservator, conservators have told me that uh, sort of the standards have changed a little and they've been discouraging people from wearing white gloves when they're handling delicate materials because they worry they, they might damage them. And so they're saying either wash your hands very well uh, without lotions or anything else and dry them and, and handle uh, documents that way or use uh, the um, nitrile, nitrile gloves as well, uh, especially with negatives and uh, photos. Let's see, Matthew asks, what are your recommendations for establishing a private household archive? What equipment and computer applications, such as archive space and past perfect, would a household archive need? Yeah, I mean, there's really no standards for a household archive. It's entirely up to you. I mean, you can use these best practices, but you know, things will definitely be more informal, and uh, you know, you wouldn't be investing in uh, high-end uh, archival software or using uh, Mark or Eid. But um, yeah, I would say whatever serves you well. Um, uh, Past perfect, uh, it, it could work. Uh, it's it's popular in the museum world, but yeah, 
any anything that's uh, you know uh, that that can accommodate the records that you have or the materials. Yeah, I don't know. Outside of the computer applications, are there any other considerations for that household? Uh, get some good storage. Um, make sure that the environment is okay because how homes can be pretty dry in the winter, depending on where you live. Um, and I would watch out for pets because in an archive, you don't have too many dogs and cats or other pets. So yeah, just, just sort of do a, a review of what the risk factors are in your home. It could be guests too. You could have guests wander into your study and start handling the records. So just put that some thought into it and just jot down what are some of the risks are and how, how you might try to mitigate uh, any risk that could arise, like your dog kind of getting a hold of uh, your archival photos uh, from, you know, the 1800s or something. Yeah, the security. There's definitely different risks at home. Security and family members. Yeah. Um, let's see. Someone says, Linda, plus other subscriptions like great courses are on, might be available through your local libraries. Yeah. Um, just because you can digitize all records doesn't mean that it won't take a lot of time to do so. Yes, it will. Um, what do you recommend for starting a small archive for a historical society that will be working with several other agencies, local, state, um, federal, possibly international? Um, are there any other standards, documents, policies, forms to know about? Yeah, I think it would be good to reach out to other historical societies and 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 find some models that you find would suit you and ones that have similar uh, budget and space and uh, yeah, a lot of historical societies that set up archives um, try to rely on some archival practices, but because if they're not archivists, you know they can't adopt it all, but. Um, yeah, I, I think just, you know, liaising with other historical societies and finding out what works for them, um, and what doesn't would be great because, uh, yeah, they're, they're serving a different clientele and, uh, yeah, they may not be open all the time. And, uh, uh, I, you know, I, you may be starting your collection from scratch. I don't know. So I, yeah, I find just finding good models and, uh, really beneficial uh, colleagues uh, to talk to is 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 really the best uh, strategy. And I suppose if you work in cooperatively, it's best to hammer out those agreements ahead of time and still yeah, stumbling. And look for partnerships. Yeah, if, if people want to take advantage of your repository, then maybe you could work out partnerships and and see what opportunities there are in terms of uh, uh, labor or perhaps funding, uh, promotional support, whatever it might be. And conferences and local organizations are often good at making those connections. Yeah, definitely. Oh, let's see. I think we've answered most of these, it looks like. Uh, our YouTube channel, um, the link was sent out to everyone, it looks like, um, but you can always just Google um, what the, uh, the uh, Archivist of Religious Collections section on YouTube, and that should get you to the, the set of videos, and most of our presentations are recorded there. Yeah, uh, they say Google SAA ARCs resources. And we're getting some thank yous for the presentation. And thank you very much, Ellen, for everything. Um, My pleasure. And I didn't note the upcoming session, but um, please uh, check your whatever list serves and other, other sources. Um, we will have continue in the new year with other uh, lunch and learn sessions. Um, and thank you very, very much for attending.